Charlie, I want to talk with you a little bit about the papal encyclical entitled Centesimus Annus, which has as an English title the hundredth year. Uh, the hundredth year being the centenary anniversary of Rerum Novarum of Leo the Thirteenth, which was uh, published in 1891. So it's hard to name these encyclicals, and I'm not so sure how many people are going to walk around talking about Centesimus Annus. It's very unfamiliar to people, and the English title, The Hundredth Year, isn't catching on either, but uh, we have to name it somehow, so we'll uh, move between those two uh, phrases. But the important thing is, what can the encyclical teach us um, about um, our own situation, about our economy, our political order, and our very structuring of human existence. And I want to focus on a phrase that the Pope introduces, and that is the notion of human ecology. In number 37, I think it is, in the document, he begins to talk about the ecological question, and he says, well, we got a problem, we consume the resources of the earth, and uh, but that can get excessive and disordered, and we can um, misuse our uh, God-given ability to transform the world. Instead, we harm the earth. And so this is a very bad thing. And he says we got to be careful of this and we have to have a proper stewardship and so on. But then he goes on to say, but we must also think about a human ecology. And by this human ecology, he means setting up sort of a moral climate or proper conditions so that human life can flourish. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the kind of things he sees messing up the human ecology and how he sees us strengthening it uh, so human existence can indeed develop as it ought to. I think his use of this term and the concept there and the, the equivalent concept or the related concept of a human environment as well as a natural environment, um, the idea that there's a dimension of being environmentalists here and being concerned about the environment that has to do not so much, you know, with the oceans and the atmosphere and the ozone layer, but with people and people relationships and social structures, um, is a helpful one. And on the one hand, certainly has roots in the whole core of this document and so much of the document tradition in terms of recognizing human dignity and the nature of, of human life is at the core of the church's social teaching, but says that we must pay attention to the kinds of dynamics between people, and that's everything from the perhaps the most limited and primary of those environments, namely the family, on up to the whole question of the total global community and issues of war, issues of the international arms race, and then the, the issues in the middle, everything from social structures to economic issues like unemployment to perhaps more social issues such as uh, the drug problem. Uh, all of those potentially then become issues for being examined with that concept of human ecology and the human environment as sort of the backdrop for them. Yes, indeed. It is really very much of a cultural analysis, as you point out, isn't it? He, he, point, he says in one place, let's remember, we don't just lo live in economic systems. You know, we can't just uh, deal with uh, economic freedom, as he says. That's only one element of freedom. We have to think of ourselves not just as subjects who produce and consume in order to live, but we're also people who enter into relationships and uh, who, do, who look for meaning and purpose in life. So this ecological uh, sort of uh, approach he's taken, this human ecology, be bears very much on the cult his cultural analysis. So in the document we find an economic analysis where he looks at the death of communism or the fall of the communism in Eastern Europe and talks about capitalism and, and points out his ambivalence about it. There's a certain kind of capitalism he favors and one he doesn't. That's a whole economic analysis, a big part of the document. There are some things he says about a political analysis, the triumph of democracy and the importance of uh, having the judicial and legislative and executive branches working together properly, harmoniously. But then there's also the cultural section. And one way of looking at the cultural section is to talk about this human ecology. And in doing so, we can turn that critique on to the United States, it seems to me, because one of the things he says is that goes badly is that um, we make bad choices about, as he says, production and consumption. He said that a culture reveals its overall understanding of life through the choices it makes in production and consumption. He says it is here that the phenomenon of consumerism arises. Now we get some of his strong statements against consumerism, this idea we're just going to buy things and buy our own happiness and having more things is what's going to give us human fulfillment. And he says it has strong things to say against that because we are defining the culture by the choices we make. 
Now, we in the United States, when we read that part, I think we see a, a lot of food for self-criticism. In what ways have we become too materialistic? In what ways have we equated uh, uh, successful human living with moving up the economic ladder? In what ways have we pushed people to the margins and then said they're inferior because they're imprisoned in this circle of poverty? That becomes very uh, strong critique for us in our culture. And I think that loops back to what the Pope was saying or criticizing in terms of the functioning of the capitalist economic system, that if you view that as a system in which individuals have a maximum uh, individual freedom to assess the needs of the human community, to commit their individual and collective efforts in work, taking that in its broadest sense, to the meeting of those needs, uh, to allow the market in the sense of the recognition of needs and response to those needs to have a significant factor in guiding the system, all of that is valid. But the minute that you start to move, I suppose it's a question of some of the old discussion about wants and needs. Mm -hmm. When you start to have a system operating on a basis of, first of all, creating a need so that as a result there is a market for a product that may be little related or even contrary to what the Pope would see as fundamental human goods and human needs, uh, then that's exactly the point at which I think he would begin to critique the system that says uh, that when the market and the fulfillment of needs is really contrary to human nature and to its ultimate directions, uh, then you can have what is economically a very flourishing climate and, humanly speaking, an extremely uh, destructive one. I think you have uh, well pointed out the connections that exist then between the economic and cultural realms. Right. And I, I liked your, your analysis of the system, and I think you're correct in saying that if you take the cultural analysis far enough, it will uh, end up being a critique of the economic system itself. And I think that's something that many of the commentators really have missed, yeah. the point that you just brought out here. There's an interesting idea that I find in uh, number 36 in the document when he talks about the quality. He says, uh -huh. today the problem is not only one of supplying people with a sufficient quantity of goods, but also responding to a demand for quality. The quality of the goods to be produced and consumed, the quality of the services to be enjoyed, and the quality of the environment and of life in general. Now that begins to criticize our sense of, uh, well, the bigger the better, uh, the more you have, the better person you are, that there is a quality of life question that has to be brought in. And I think, you know, there's many people in the United States who are really feeling this. I mean, I know people who are rising up the corporate ladder and who decided not to take the next step because they wanted to keep their kids in a particular school because they liked the school. I know people who actually have not moved to different jobs because they were so... Uh, immersed in the parish in which they uh, belong. Mm -hmm. So there's a question where people are making choices these days in the United States based on quality of life rather than simply making more money or having more goods. I think the somewhat individualist strain of the American culture is a bit edgy about letting anyone other than the individual decide what is the good life for him or for her. But that question of whether the meeting of particular needs or the providing of particular goods really contributes to a better life or not um, is an issue that has to be looked at, you know, as you analyze where the Pope's argument is coming from. Um, if, if I risk another short quotation, he says, it is not wrong to want to live better. And I think the American culture would say, well, you got that right. Yeah. He says, what is wrong is a style of life which is presumed to be better when it is directed toward having rather than being which wants to have more, not in order to be more, but in order to spend life in enjoyment as an end in itself. Well, and that's so a, That's a telling quote. You picked out a good one, Charlie. He talks about growth and development. He would certainly, I think, see a wide range of moving beyond simply, well, as long as everybody has food, clothing, and shelter, you don't need to worry about anything else. He would certainly talk about quality of life, growth, and development. He would also talk about quality of life in terms of recognizing the tremendous disparities in a society and realizing that even in some of those absolutely basic elements in the United States alone, let alone in the global community for which he's writing, those fundamental needs are not being met. And so I'm certain that he would critique an approach that places more emphasis on the providing of, if you will, consumer goods that are more directed at enjoyment, at relaxation, at leisure and that is not oriented towards looking at much more fundamental needs in the whole global community. I think he feels it's more important to feed people that are starving in the world uh, than to provide you know, the latest high-tech, 
upgrade of the Nintendo system at home. Yeah, he uh, doesn't pick a say that example. specifically, but as you said, you were going by his principles that you uh, quoted for us there and saying that would be a logical conclusion, mm-hmm. I, and I think I would agree with that. Uh, it's interesting to see how he thinks we're going to move in this uh, healthier direction. He says that we really need to form mature personalities who can make uh, careful choices along this line. Then he said, thus a great deal of educational and cultural work is urgently needed, including, this is an interesting phrase, the education of consumers in the responsible use of their power of choice, the formation of a strong sense of responsibility among producers and among people in the mass media in particular, as well as the necessary intervention by public authorities. It is that phrase, though, the education of the consumer in making use of their power of choice, which I find an interesting Mm -hmm. one. Now, if you start to think, what does that mean? Well, that means an education in values in the family. It means an attempt to keep a lid on the materialism. Uh, It means an effort to maybe simplify the lifestyle, to try to teach the next generation that there's more to life than simply getting a better job and uh, rising up, uh, moving up the economic ladder. So he wants us to educate to, about the use of their power of choice. But what is it we're going to spend our money on? And uh, how does a family expend its uh, resources? He thinks education is crucial to all of that. And I, I would tend to agree with uh, that analysis, I think. He certainly, as you mentioned, family, Jim, stresses that the family and the experience of life within the family setting as being very basically an element of that human ecology of creating a human environment. Um, He uses that as an occasion, rather surprisingly to me as I read the document, to also speak a bit in passing to even the abortion issue and talking about it in terms of not so much a, a, a genetic or a medical question, but simply in terms of the question of a civil right, talking about a right to life in that regard. I know a couple of the articles in commenting on it were suggesting if he's going to get into that, he needs to talk more widely to the issue. But he sees the family and the kind of people dynamic there, and in these documents continually seem to contrast those people dynamics and everything from like the family to the trade union to voluntary associations as over and against structured governmental type uh, forces at work in the overall political and economic environment. By and large, the whole tradition of documents, and this one included, uh, much more favorably applauds and encourages collective action by people in organizations of their own choosing, uh, and does say that the role of structured intervention by government should be in a very limited and on the principle of subsidiarity a very restricted one. And in that regard, I suspect Michael Novak and Newhouse and those people would quite rightly say, you know, he's coming down on our side of some issues. I think uh, you're right in that analysis. The people you mentioned, Richard Newhouse, a convert from Lutheranism to Catholicism recently. Michael Novak, well-known author in the field, especially of economics and politics, uh, have often uh, accused the papal uh, writers, the popes in their encyclicals, of uh, uh, statism. Uh, an approach which says that, well, the state needs to come in and solve these problems. In fact, that was one of the criticisms raised against the American bishop's pastoral letter uh, of 1986 on uh, economic justice for all, the the, uh, pastoral letter that got a lot of publicity. Some said it's too statism, too much Mm -hmm. in favor of statism, which means that government should intervene and take care of all of these things. I've never accepted that criticism precisely for the reason you just suggested, that when you read these documents carefully, they distinguish society from state. State Mm -hmm. is the government. Society is the whole body of people making up a particular Mm -hmm. country or finally the global community. And it's society that has the responsibility to attend to these things. And very often it is done through voluntary organizations, through natural communities, especially the family. And so the emphasis he puts on the family, and that's number 39 in this cultural section of the of this encyclical centesimus annus, or the hundredth year, as we call it in English, um, the the, the large uh, role for the family is one of these uh, associations that uh, helps the principle of subsidiarity to function properly. He calls the family the sanctuary of life. He says the family is indeed sacred. It's within the family that we learn how to interact as human beings. We learn the give and take of social interaction. He said the family is the heart of the culture of life. The family is the building block, as he says, of uh, human ecology, the first and fundamental structure. 
so that um, this carefully links up with our theme here, Charlie, where we're talking about human ecology. It's the family that, that is, has a primary role. And it undercuts this idea that papal documents are statist in, mm. their, in their general approach to how you solve problems. I think uh, in that same section of the encyclical, I found the kind of collective piece in terms of his saying you've got to look broader than an economic analysis, and it's right in that section. It says the economy, in fact, is only one aspect and one dimension of the whole of human activity. So in other words, he'd be saying that to reduce your whole analysis simply to an economic model won't wash because it's leaving out significant dimensions of, of human reality. It says if economic life is absolutized, if the production and consumption of goods become the center of social life and society's only value and not subject to any other value, then the reason is not so much in the economic system itself, but rather in the broader socio-cultural system. Yeah. I think that, that's exactly yeah. right. I think he's on target with that. And mm -hmm. as we begin to, to you, you need the combination. I mean, let's take up the question of drugs. He, he, he does okay. deal with drugs at one place. And he says, he says this, the widespread use of drugs is a sign of a serious malfunction in the social system. It also implies a materialistic and, in a certain sense, destructive reading of human needs. In this way, the innovative capacity of a free economy is brought to a one-sided and inadequate conclusion. Drugs, as well as pornography and other forms of consumerism, which exploit the frailty of the weak, tend to fill the resulting spiritual void. Now, I mean, you see how he, drugs is a good touch point here mm -hmm. for your analysis. He links it to the economy, you know, the, the, it's an economic question. We mm -hmm. find many people analyzing it that way. You'll mm -hmm. say, you know, the, you'll have people saying, well, if you were a young person in a ghetto in the cities and had no chance of getting a job, 50% of your fellow teenagers or young people are unemployed, I mean, economically, and you got a chance to sell drugs, to make it economically, well, what choice are people going to make? Mm -hmm. I mean, it is in that sense, from, a, from an economic viewpoint, very understandable mm -hmm. why many people get involved in drugs. I mean, it's very extremely destructive, but there often appears to be no other way out to them. So there's an economic factor in it. But also, there is a moral cultural factor in all of this, because it's got to do with a spiritual void, as he says. You know, it also implies sort of a materialistic reading uh, and a destructive reading of human needs. So uh, there is a moral cultural side to it uh, that has to do with meaning and purpose and life and so on. That section, incidentally, is in number 36 where he takes up that question of drugs. It's the fourth paragraph in, uh, yes. or third paragraph, I guess, in yes. number uh, 36. Um, he also mentions, as I said in passing, pornography, but the drugs is the is the touchstone of the paragraph. But I think it brings out what you were saying, how uh, the, it really puts together the economic question with the cultural kind of question. And uh, the way out again has to do, I think, as he pointed out before, education in terms of what our real needs are, and of course, uh, economic reform that's going to leave us with something better than 50% black teenage unemployment in the United States. He also raises in that same area, um, he even he talks about, and certainly as you, as you look at you know, just contemporary news and everything from the stock market to the total state of the American economy, uh, you're talking about investment and capital available and amount of you know, money tied up in various kinds of investments. He says, even the decision to invest in one place rather than another, or in one productive sector rather than another, is always a moral and cultural choice, that even that issue of mm -hmm. uh, you know, where I decide to put you know, such excess resources as I may have, uh, that there is a cultural and a moral dimension to that, that the effect of putting my money simply into a speculative investment that will make more money for me, regardless of its impact on how the money is used. Um, certainly, I would think some of the people that in working with some of the cooperative movement and some of the cooperative banking kinds of things and credit unions, you know, all of which structures that have been frequently applauded in some of these documents, saying that, that we have we are making a moral and a cultural choice by w uh, much in the same way of talking about informed consumer decisions where we choose to no. place such investment resources as we have in terms of what's going to be the human impact of putting it in one place vis-a-vis yeah. -vis another you know it reminds me of is the enterprise zones you know yes. one of the uh, ideas that i thought really was good 
from the 1980s, and I don't know how much it ever got implemented, but it always made a lot of sense to me to give certain tax breaks and credits to industries to be able mm -hmm. to locate their plants or factories mm -hmm. or manufacturing uh, means it, it within inner cities or within areas where there's high unemployment or within mm -hmm. areas where people don't have free access to transportation to get to jobs elsewhere. That always made a lot of sense to me. And periodically I hear the idea raised up again, enterprise zones. And I don't know what really has ever happened with it or whether we have any successes along that. I know in our own city we've had closings in uh, inner city areas of uh, mm -hmm. small manufacturing mm -hmm. plants and so on, which are very distressing. Uh, evidently, for one reason or another, could not make it. But somehow, one would like to think there's a way to place the use of capital properly so that we can uh, help indeed to those who are most in need, especially of jobs. I don't mean right. handouts. That's what I mean, jobs, employment. I think it's true also in terms of the church's own direct involvement here. I'm thinking of the the, the frequently cited you know, the difference between giving a man a fish and teaching him to fish, right. that the church itself, which still has and is seen almost as primarily having a role in terms of charity and in, in giving to the needy and feeding the hungry. But as the church has resources of its own, whether it be dollar resources, whether it be buildings, whether it be the expertise of the personnel in the church community, we might look at the question of how does this sort of document invite us to invest our resources as church in what has to do with human development as opposed to simply direct aid programs of charity. Uh, the sense that uh, we as church also have resources to contribute to the formation of that human environment and that human ecology which he sees as so fundamental to an overall just, uh, not only economically just but socially and culturally just uh, human situation. You know what I like, Charlie, about the, the Pope's analysis is, is note that there are goods which by their very nature cannot and must not be bought or sold. Yeah. That's something that we really have to hear. And there's a theory that one of the reasons for depression in the United States among young people today is that who grow up in affluent families, they mm -hmm. grow up thinking that you can buy whatever you want. And, uh, you know, if you want an ice cream cone, you can get it. You want a bicycle, you get it. At 16, you want a car, you get it. You get the kind you want and so on. And that what is set up is an expectation that, therefore, you can buy anything that you want, mm -hmm. including things like community or love happiness. or happiness. Mm -hmm. And, therefore, when peop people, young people grow up in that environment and then they can't buy that, can't make it happen, they don't have control over it, well, you end up with a lot of depression, a tenfold increase in the United States. Mm -hmm. Not that that's the only mm -hmm. factor. I don't mean to imply that, but there's a big increase mm -hmm. in the current uh, depression rate, episodic depression. And in hostility also, and in yeah. terms of community violence, which right. may also, as well as other economic factors, be related to that expectation. And when I find that I cannot buy it, when I cannot get it in any of the normal means of exchange, I will choose to take it, just in a, out of frustration and the, the social unrest that that contributes to the whole human environment just becomes then terribly counterproductive. You know, the Pope links it to what he calls an idolatry of the market. That's incidentally ah. a number 40 for anybody who looks at the document. Number 40 talks about an idolatry of the market, an idolatry which ignores the existence of goods which by their nature are not and cannot be mere commodities. So make an I idol out of the market is to think you mm -hmm. can buy and sell all great human realities. And what the Pope is saying is it's bigger than that. There's a mm -hmm. larger cultural world that we have to think about that has to do with the great realities of freedom mm -hmm. and of love and of community and that those have to be viewed in a very different way. You cannot buy or sell those great realities. And that certainly loops around to where we began, too, because I think, in a sense, it would almost paraphrase his critique of the capitalist system to say that you should value but not idolize the role of the market, to see it as a positive and productive and important element in economic life, certainly, to idolize it as the sole or the primary place that inevitably will produce good decisions and say, no, this does not function that way. Right, and it gets back to a point that uh, I think is very much in your consciousness, and that is that his anthropology is key to all of this. And, and so. He talks in one place about a human person's essential capacity for transcendence, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that we have the ability to give ourselves to another person, to other persons, and ultimately to give ourselves to God, who's the author of our being. And so that... Um, what, what happens, he thinks, is, and Marxism has really cre helped create this, is an alienation from self 
when you lived in, in this empty vacuum situation mm -hmm. where there are not these higher goods that one can pursue. Mm -hmm. you, we are, end up being alienated from ourselves. So that alienation for the Pope is something that happens both in collectivist, communist societies, mm -hmm. and also can happen in uh, capitalistic societies like our own where we have affluence. We can still be alienated, cut off from ourselves, estranged from our deeper longings and our real desire for meaning and purpose. As he says, a society itself can be alienated if its forms of social organization and production and consumption make it more difficult for people to offer this gift of themselves and to establish solidarity. And so it's not only a question of individual alienation, no. but the society itself can either uh, impede or uh, facilitate that alienation by the way some of those structures are set up. Yes, you, you again, you bring up the institutional element very well, and I think that that all connects in with it. Well, Charlie, we've been talking here about uh, the Pope's phrase, human ecology, and trying to tease out some of its meaning and connect it with other parts of, the in, of his encyclical, uh, Centesimus Annus, the hundredth year, the anniversary of Leo the Thirteenth. And in this human ecology, you can see a lot of things can go wrong. You can have excessive consumerism. People just want more goods. You can have drugs that uh, uh, really mess up the whole society. And he sees education as being one of the ways that we're going to overcome all of that. And as part of this great human ecology, as you so well pointed out, he sees the value of the family and of voluntary associations. The family becomes the sanctuary where we learn how to interact. And then he's got this marvelous larger vision of, of us human beings with a capacity for transcendence, of reaching out for goods that cannot be just uh, produced in the market or looked at economically. So the document is wonderful in this human ecology, setting a spiritual climate where human beings can flourish.